Welcome to the latest Sitting Comfortably podcast. That's Sitting Comfortably podcast, not Sitting Podfully Comcast. This is Laurel Lindstrom speaking, reading from The Draftsman, my first novel. In the first episode, we met Martin Cox, the eponymous draftsman of the title, and his sister Alison. We learned a little about Joshua Fothergill, and we learned a little about Shadowhurst Hall. In the next episode, this one, we're going to learn a little more about Martin and the house. Simon will meet Simon... No, Martin will meet Simon the gardener. And we will learn why Martin has bought this house. Are we sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. The Draftsman, Chapter 1, Part 2. Martin hadn't been much interested when Joshua tried to tell him about the original house, its history how it had been requisitioned in the war, why it ended up derelict, what happened to all its parts and pieces as they crumbled and fell. But, as the conversation came back to him in similar parts and pieces, Martin remembered that his initial resistance to the place crumbled and fell because he couldn't really think of any good reason not to buy a Shadowhurst Hall. Joshua was right. This was a new opportunity and a challenge as well as a good investment, a place to bury a fortune. Martin wanted to reach a place of resurrection. Somewhere between the money and him, between Joshua and Alison, this house could be the bridge. He looked back at the lake, lying smooth in the still dead air, its uncertain shades and shadows rimmed with weedy debris, seasonless, lifeless, empty empty memories of long-gone summers shivered on its surface. Close to the tired fence, bare trees, their twisted, grasping fingers in old blacks and sepias, wrote long-forgotten secrets against a miserable sky. Martin's cigarette burned down in a series of tiny pops and hisses, whispers hanging momentarily in the desolate grey air. As he stared, he felt a curious sense of erosion, a creeping, unidentifiable darkness. "'Are you coming in?' Alison called. Walking towards her, Martin tossed his cigarette end into a puddle, seeing rippled reflections of the sky as its picture shifted. His footsteps were measured and slow, because he knew how much it annoyed her. She couldn't tap her foot or pace effectively in wellies, he mused. Together and in silence, they wandered slowly around the building, side by side but not too close, Alison wanting, as always, to reach out, Martin keeping still behind his prickly shield, denying all comers. Beyond touch. They passed forgotten flower beds full of tangled old nettles and dead grass and crossed a broken, stone-twisted terrace. Carefully, over uncertain cracks and lifting stones, they moved in tentative steps to the back of the house. Now, the lake and a second lake, its companion, were fully visible. A grassy track linked the lakes together, bridging the dreary lawns to the fields beyond. The waters, a mirrored pair, stared sightless at the sky, still anonymous and blind. The back door was unlocked, and as they entered the kitchen, a wash of pale spring light flooded flooded under the dust moats, already dancing. in the rays coming in from the picture windows. Keeping on her tight tweed jacket and overflowing scarf, Alison stepped neatly out of the wellies into a pair of flat pointy-toed pumps, fished from the depths of her bag. She bustled across the room to lean against a shiny new argo, gleaming snug and cosy. It lent the space a vague and languid warmth, but the heat could not penetrate the slate floor. Intense cold seeped up through their shoes, a slow, spreading stain that chilled and pinched their toes. "'Cold enough,' Alison said, as Martin took in the room. It was much as he expected, with the same sturdy pine table and couple of chairs that had been there when he first saw the house, but in addition he noted the large, very new fridge, an almost soundless monster. It was centred in the middle of its own wall, like a shrine, Sightless and monolithic, the brushed chrome deity softly hummed a cold and bloodless harmony to the Argus' gentle whispering warmth. 
The room's quiet and chill, and its soft murmurs held Martin momentarily still. He wondered if he had ever been this close to silence. He felt a curious sense of clarity, and the fleeting embrace of a sensation long since lost to memory. He didn't notice a hapless sparrow hit the picture window, or see the model of feathery brown wheel off dizzy to the safety of the nearest branch. The bird jolted Alison out of her warming moment with the arger, and she restarted the effort to give Martin her report on the house. Fixed and full of surging purpose, she wanted to be sure he had all the facts, that he understood that she had followed his requirements for the Wi-Fi, the stereo system, the fridge, all of it. I've tried to follow the instructions, so I hope you've got everything you need, she said, watching him suck on his cigarette, deep and long for the last millimetres. As he stubbed it out on the draining board and pulled his fingers through the long hair flopping down over his forehead, he turned a blank look on her, apparently a stranger in his sight. Alison held his gaze, eyes fixed, head on one side, a small smile of affection for this familiar look. To her, it signified an apathetic, slightly bored trust, rather than distance and alienation. She was six years older than her brother, and liked to think she understood him. They stood in suspended harmony one to the other, her with her faux, painted, patient smile, and him, detached in familiar isolation, seeing his sister, as always, from a distance. Alison understood this, and waited for him to reconnect. Hovering in his black jeans and T-shirt, black-booted and draped as usual in a dark blue velvet, he was holding on to something in his head, Patience was Alison's only option. She has no route into his headspace. But patience doesn't come easily to a woman resolutely on track, almost since the moment she was born. Their parents' darling child, obsessively obedient, following the lines, looking always ahead at the next ambition, always on a mission, and never once looking over her shoulder at what was behind. First it was to get the A's at A-level, then the university place and a double first in art history, a degree she knew would take her into perfect husband territory. And it did. Martin's narrow and fixed path took him to an altogether other place. Bored with the wait and taking cakes and instant coffee out of her basket, Alison looked around slightly confused, disorientated in the new space. They heard a forced cough, and the door connecting the kitchen to the rest of the house opened. "'So you're here, then. I came in at the front. "'Ah, oh, Simon,' she said. "'Excellent!' "'Excellent?' Martin wondered, unconvinced. Watching the mutual helloing, he remembered about Simon. Martin shoved his hands deep into his coat pockets and stared at the floor, waiting. A Motorola razor phone, his cigarettes and Zippo lighter all reassuringly in place. The noise of the conversation battering the air was meaningless. He retreated into mental scans of his filthy penthouse up in town, curling into the memory of its safe and fetid embrace. But he was here in this new and foreign space, so that he couldn't be there. He was here for his stress, for his health, to change his life, to heal, to whatever, to remember, to forget who knows. They said this house is a good idea, a sound investment, all that, all that, all that noise, all those voices and the humming buzz, distant but growing louder. Fingering another cigarette, he looked up at the stranger, now silent, waiting. Simon, shabby in worn-out work clothes and with a vaguely insolent air, looked slightly beyond Martin as they were introduced, trying to fix his gaze on the monster fridge, but his fascination got the better of him. They, too, were unwilling players, with looks in the eye at once slightly hostile and yet resigned. Martin, Simon, Simon, Martin! Alison's flailing hands gestured her introductions, rather as if she was paddling a canoe. Martin put the cigarette between his teeth and hissed, Hi! lit it and turned away to look out of the window, Simon turned in tandem and looked out of the window too, unaware that he was being ignored. 
Sixty-ish and newly nicked and shaved, Simon had thinning grey hair pushed and carefully sculpted back in memory of some long-gone quiff. Noticing the dead cigarette ends on the draining board and floor and the lighting of another, he cleared his throat as if to make a point. Instead, I'm the gardener, he said. I do the odd jobs. Mildly awkward as he looked down at the floor, the woolly outline of his grubby sock blurred against its faceless black. Martin still stared away and said, What gardening? Simon had no ear for irony. I just do, always have. It's what I do for the place. Mowing mainly, hedges, wood, that sort of thing. Martin turned his head to look at him. Wood. OK. Slow nodding in total incomprehension and remembering that keeping Simon on was not a choice. It was part of the sale. Simon came with the house and could keep his job until he was ready to retire. Are you planning to retire soon? Martin asked. And Simon, pulling his hair through his his hand through his hair, feigning sheepishness, but grinning back an adamant no, sir, with impertinence barely concealed. The job interview was over. Still smiling, Simon said, I'll be here for as long as you want me. Well, at least until tea time. That's the end of part two of chapter one of The Draftsman. I'll be doing some more in the Sitting Comfortably podcast and hopefully you've enjoyed listening to this and um, we'll reconnect soon. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.